28 Days Later is a terrifying new thriller from Danny Boyle, the man who brought us train spotting. Set 28 days after a devastating epidemic ravages Britain, the film follows a handful of survivors as they struggle to make sense of the aftermath. Very simply, it's a story of a, a group of, of survivors uh, trying to make their way to safety after the outbreak of a terrible viral infection. It gives people this incurable disease which fills their veins and blood with their pure rage and it turns them into these infected people. And then eventually everything just stops and you know, there's only so many people left. No! No! But how far from reality, though, is the premise of 28 Days Later? And how protected are we from a new killer pandemic? We evaluated overall trends in deaths due to infectious diseases. Looked at in this way, infectious diseases haven't gone away. They have increased as a cause of death in recent years after decades of decline. The threat to us at the moment from infectious diseases is probably as big as it's ever been and getting worse. The threat of infection to human mortality on a worldwide scale is still very great. We have to anticipate that there will be a major pandemic. At some stage, there will be many deaths associated with that. I remember actually when I was at secondary school and my, my teacher was saying that, you know, we shouldn't worry about global warming or any of these things. She said you should worry about viruses and that, for some reason, has always stayed with me. There's something very interesting happened while we were filming. There were two German scientists who um, created a totally synthetic um, polio virus, but they got all the material off the web. It is the new fear, isn't it? You know, even in weapons of mass destruction, what everybody's really worried about is the anthrax, smallpox, those kind of things. Infectious diseases are indeed the new paranoia that's striking Western society. It is this fear of invisible threats to you, you know, just something there in the air waiting to strike. If you forget about a disease and consider it beaten, then um, the organism will take the opportunities which you increasingly offer it. <laughs> Nothing else has the power to bring a nation to its knees like the consequences of a killer epidemic. I expect new things to appear over the years, but you can't predict when and where. I don't think we're ever far from the next pandemic. Over the last 10 years, an alarmingly high number of national crises have been a direct consequence of infectious disease. There's always been rumblings. I mean, I've always felt a little uneasy in the, in the way things have been going. It's constantly testing what the world can take, you know? In the case of foot and mouth, it resulted in the slaughter of over five million animals. That's more than the entire human population of Liverpool. We saw in the uh, foot and mouth epidemic just how quickly things can spread. More than 127,000 farms were subjected to infected area restrictions. It put the greatest strain imaginable on the country's animal health services. Eventually, it resulted in the military being drafted in. So you heard our broadcast? Yeah, we did. We must be a disappointment. You were hoping for a full brigade, an army base with helicopters and a field hospital. We're just hoping for... The answer to infection. Yeah. The cost to the economy has been estimated at over £4.2 billion. From the, the recent um, outbreak of foot and mouth disease, I think we've actually learned some important lessons. We can't always prevent the outbreaks of infectious disease in the UK. Our aim is to pick them up quickly, provide the evidence on which uh, containment measures can be taken and build a protection system such as through vaccination. If an illness can spread so quickly, and have such an effect on the nation's livestock, 
surely it's not just the animals that are at risk. We need to take very seriously the possible threat of diseases moving from animals to us. It's now been almost incontrovertibly established that, that the virus which causes HIV in us came from monkeys. One concern that is high in people's minds is the ability of some organisms to transfer from animals to people and cause serious um, disease. There are over 400 known pathogens that can already transmit from animals to people. In Malaysia a few years ago, a big outbreak of, of uh, what was called Nipah virus disease in pigs spread to human beings and caused over 100 deaths. We shouldn't assume that if a disease is in an animal, that it won't at some stage pose a threat to us. At the moment, foot and mouth can't infect humans, but there is a chance it might evolve. Like a family. Do you think they're infected? No. Look at variant CJD, you know, the human form of mad cow disease. Where was that 30 years ago? It didn't exist. There are concerns that new diseases do arise and will arise. That's the whole nature of evolution. I've got some bad news. Increased mobility is one huge factor in that much more international travel than we've ever had before. The day before the TV and radio stopped broadcasting, there were reports of infection in Paris and New York. We didn't hear anything more after that. Infection knows no boundaries, no man-made boundaries between countries, so there has to be international collaboration in tracking the spread of infectious diseases. But in the very nature of evolution, new ones will evolve or change and be able to cause disease, we have to be ready to deal with them. What about the government? What are they doing? There's no government. Of course there's a government. There's always a government. They're in a, a bunker or a plane. The notion that we can put our faith in, 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 in institutions and forget about them is what the danger is. We saw a little bit of that with the BSE thing. And, you know, they, just, that was, they couldn't cope. The notion that you can say, well, I have a gun there, so that means I'm safe, is a nonsense. <laughs> to infection is here. If it's a recording, for all we know, the soldiers who made it are dead. It's possible, yeah. And that stuff about the answer to infection, I mean, there is no answer to infection. It's already done pretty much all the damage it can. Maybe they have a cure. Maybe they've got nothing at all. Well, the only way to find out is to reach them. We could die trying, Frank. In the last year of the 20th century, communicable diseases accounted for an estimated 25% of deaths worldwide. When you look at tuberculosis worldwide and malaria and the other infectious diseases, uh, gastroenteritis in the third world, these are major killers. Every day the human body is coming under attack from disease-causing microbes. Nobody is immune. We're living in a sea of bacteria, let there be no doubt about that. They're in our environment, they're on our skin. So the idea of a new killer epidemic infecting the country is not far-fetched at all. Yes, in the United States, we've seen the West Nile virus, which is a disease of birds spread between them by mosquitoes. But if those mosquitoes happen to bite people, they can transmit the virus to people who get an encephalitis. But it would be, I think, very unfortunate if people didn't sensibly think if there is an outbreak that suddenly strikes the place well let's follow certain simple rules because if something like this were to happen uh, like scares or biological warfare that's what you see happening I see this panic you know and what you get in this film is the remnants of panic I looked down and I was standing on all these people like a carpet people who had fallen and somewhere in the crowd they were infected spread fast. It's not so much a question of will it happen, but when will it happen? Just as the Darwinian principles of survival of the fittest and evolution are accepted for mammals, then the same is happening at a much smaller level for bacteria. And that whenever they're put under intolerable pressure, as they may be by the common use of an antibiotic, for example, then they will pretty rapidly find a way around it. Only travel during daylight, unless you've got no choice. So what is the virus that wipes out the population of London in 28 days later? Scientists are experimenting and trying to find a cure for rage, kind of like a suppressant drug, like the Valium for a depression or whatever, very roughly, and it goes wrong. I know who you are. 
I know what you think you're doing. You don't want to get hurt. Keep your mouth shut and don't move a muscle. The chimps are infected. They're, they're highly contagious. They've been given an inhibitor. Infected with what? In order to cure, you must first understand. Infected with the... what? Rage. It's a primate-based uh, virus. It's um, hideously virulent. It's spread by contact with the blood. Scratches, bites, etc. And it leads to the all permanent, appalling state of aggression. Mela? Jim. Jim. Mela. Got infected two days ago. Feel this incredible rage which blots out any other feeling at all and you know rage manifests itself in just totally wanting to destroy another person destroy buildings um, it's just about complete destruction imagine yourself in your worst moment of road rage and multiply it by a million and that's what these people are like it opens up big philosophical things that whether we it's a very modern disease or whether it's always been with us it's actually part of us you know and all it's doing is bringing out something that we're all terribly, I'm afraid, capable of. If someone gets infected, you've got between 10 and 20 seconds to kill them. It might be your brother or your sister or your oldest friend. It makes no difference. And just so you know where you stand, if it happens to you, I'll do it in a heartbeat. We've fled this whole notion of rage and, you know, the modern malaise and the infection of it. And we come into something that's even more frightening, which is where, where that notion of survival hits base and where it's every man for himself. The world is over. And it's just how you deal with continuing life. Do you know what I was thinking? You were thinking that you'll never hear another piece of original music ever again. You'll never read a book that hasn't already been written. Or see a film that hasn't already been shot. Um, that's what you were thinking. In 28 Days Later, the filmmakers created a thoroughly gripping vision of a country crippled by a new disease. For me, when you read a screenplay that's a good screenplay, you see the film, and that's the way Alex writes. If you've read The Beach, uh, whatever you think of the story, I think you, you visualise it, he, and, he, and you you want to know what happens next. What attracted me most about the script was the, the intelligence of it and, 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 the, and the issues that it was trying to investigate and the, the comment it was making on society in general. If you look at the whole life of the planet, man has only been around for a few blinks of an eye. So if the infection wipes us all out, that is a return to normality. I thought the script was terrifying. I thought it was a, it was a real page turner. When I find myself saying the lines in my head, I, I usually figure it's not, I wouldn't be miscast in it. I thought, I was reading, I think, oh, this is my kind of film. And so it's like I'd go to watch it in the cinemas and so... That's what I said to him, I said, I like this, Danny, it's terrifying. Good, good. In maintaining a realistic edge to the film, the filmmakers decided to use a cast of less familiar actors. Jim is like the everyman, do you know what I mean? He's just the guy off the street, he's the bike courier. He wakes up out of a coma in a, in a hospital and the hospital is just completely abandoned and he walks out onto Westminster Bridge and London is just desolate. And there's signs of that something unusual has gone down. Selena is one of the people who's survived um, the rage virus that's been set loose. She's had to shut down emotionally in order to survive, so she's quite cold. You should be more concerned about whether they're going to slow you down. Right, because if they slowed you down... I'd leave them behind. In a heartbeat? Yeah. I wouldn't. Then you're going to wind up getting yourself killed. I have this wonderful relationship with my daughter and we're hiding out in the survival mode um, in a high-rise flat. He, he was just a very beautifully written character. We have a spare room. In there. Are you in Selena? No, 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 no. Um, no, I'll take the, the living room. It's fine. Right. I play a character called Major Henry West, who's a senior officer in the British Army. Um, he and his eight soldiers are uninfected. 
but basically what he's done is he's taken over um, a stately pile, a mansion, um, and he's made it impregnable. High perimeter wall, which helps. And we've been lacing the ground with trip wires and landmines. You wouldn't want to mow the lawn, but if they get in, we hear them. She doesn't trust the army saying that they have the answer to infection, and she knows that there actually is no answer to infection. He represents the head, and Jim represents the heart. And ultimately, there's conflict between the two. I want to give you a chance. You can be with us. To create a more urban feel to the images, the filmmakers chose digital video over film. I think it, it's beautiful for urban work. It has a grittiness about it that's uh, magnificent for your city movie, really. Hey, 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 hey. What's that? Let's go. This is the way we record our lives. We are surrounded in this city by cameras. They're everywhere, and they're all these DV cameras, or types of them, and they're recording our every motion all the time. It definitely suits the, suits the story, suits the British story, particularly that sort of slightly rough edge. I think when you want something like this to feel really real, you know, it's an appropriate medium to use. Hello? occasions you know you might just go Phew. and there's a camera there so you have to be aware of it all the time you know but it's great because you can get so many different perspectives and you can do things that you can't do with big 35 mm cameras you can't just sort of wait for your for your single or, or for yours close-up shot or whatever mm. you're always mindful there's at least two cameras on the go which you've got to be aware of as an actor because you can sometimes think it's a wide and there's one stuck in there that is covering you very close the film shows a post-apocalyptic landscape created in the aftermath of the epidemic. But creating a completely deserted vision of London was no easy task. We never would have shot that with film. The police were quite happy to assist us and the councils, to assist us doing it because we could do it so quickly. We could be ready to shoot in literally minutes. Walking around deserted London was a big buzz. It was action and you're in it. You know, and there was nothing there. And once you get into that space in your head, it was just fantastic, you know. What we tried to do was try and find kind of iconic images that, again, did the work of a huge, huge budget, you know? When you see the whole of Westminster Bridge and the embankment all closed for you, and the traffic stop and you can't hear anything, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> the triumph of actually managing to make that look deserted, I think, is quite, you know, it's incredible. One of the problems with emptying London now is that, like, I think probably before dance music, you could, you could have probably done it, but now, because of dance culture, of course, which has opened clubs, people are piling out of the clubs at dawn, you know, <laughs> and, they, and they overlap with all the kind of people arriving to clean the offices. The filming also required an entire section of the M1 to be closed. I think they only gave us was it two or three goes at it, so you don't have very much time, and so you're just under a great deal of pressure to kind of get this right. There was like windows where you have like, I don't know, three or four minutes to get the shot where the, 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 the traffic is held down, down the road. Um, so it was brilliant, but it was a weird experience again to see, a, to see a, a, a motorway of that size just empty. That was unbelievable. I thought that was uh, quite chilling, actually, that set with the motorway blocked off and a big sign for Manchester and desolation. Must be Manchester. whole of Manchester, the whole city. When you do it for real, things happen, you know, actors are different and it changes everything because suddenly it's there for the actors. They don't have to imagine, they don't have to imagine that the traffic will be removed or that the dinosaur will be there, you know, it actually is there for them. The film also required a large team of makeup artists to create the infected look. Well, we've been experiencing a lot of gore at the moment. A lot of gore. Lots of, um, lots of buckets of fake yeah. blood and... Gallons of spewy bile and edible vomit. And <laughs> all sorts of different variations on blood. Um, but you become immune to it. I mean, you know, you'd be sitting down having your lunch, head to foot, and 
people. It's a bit surreal. You're sitting there and then there's just like an infected person walking past or eating when they're no, like sitting next to you and wherever. Yeah, and it is very gruesome, very I gruesome. I still got a bit of him in my teeth, look. <laughs> Danny, he really likes all that stuff, doesn't he? Because he's behind the monitor, you know? And I thought, oh yeah, it's a sort of a recurring thing with Danny, this sort of ultra violence. There's two kind of effects in the film, really, um, to try and create a kind of both a plausible world, i.e. a post-apocalyptic plausible world, and also an atmospheric world that is very that has a strange atmosphere about it. The one that really got me was the rain, because rain is really, really makes things so difficult. Because by the time you got the rain right and the light right and the angle, so you could see the rain, and then trying to do the shot, you know, it was that was very difficult. We used the digital effects more to try and create an atmosphere, particular use of colours in the film. Because you're in a digital medium anyway, it's very responsive. You can actually play with. Uh, the visual impact of the film in different ways. You know, there's a freedom to do that. Essential for the action sequences was a high level of fitness, and some of the cast endured military training. We had a um, two, three day boot camp where we did military exercises. It was um, an experience to tell you, the, yeah. to tell you that much. Yeah, it was, um, I'm, I'm used to staying indoors overnight and stuff like that. <laughs> that. That didn't really work out. It was hard stuff, but. I'm glad I did it, I'm glad I stuck it out because I think it's all showing on screen. And they're putting us right on the edge sometimes yeah, yeah. Right now with the stuff that you're doing. There's a rule in the army, but a force is generally a leap and a bound. You should never be more than a leap and a bound away from your own personal weapon. And, uh, and after two days, they're starting to get it, and you can see them getting nervous when they're a little bit further away from their own weapon. I used both the machine gun and then a mounted machine gun, um, which is I, I find pretty frightening, to be honest, you know. I didn't particularly get a buzz out of it. It's not something that uh, I enjoyed, but you know, I can see why a certain sort of man may feel more potent. And then we had two days actually here on location, teaching them basic infantry skills, um, as well as the specific tasks that they'd all need to carry out in each individual scene. Learned a little bit how to move like a soldier, and obviously how to think like a soldier. Um, actors let, learn a, a lot more quickly than soldiers do. Um, which is which is a great relief. Otherwise, we'd have had to be here for six months before we did this. I do, you know. I use my imagination a lot of the time. That's what my job's about. Twenty-eight days later is proving a hard film to categorise. Action, science fiction, horror, horror, horror slasher. We sell it and present it, I think, as a horror movie. Disaster. One thing is certain. It's a warning for us as well as an entertainment, you know? The threat of new disease is increasing. As a society, we're being miles too careless with our medicine. We are definitely assuming that we can cure anything. And the human race should be on high alert. Are we safe in the first world from infectious diseases? Certainly not. I wouldn't say so. It's, it's, it's dark stuff, you know. My own belief is that we're not very close to a major pandemic occurring. But then, had you asked me 20 years ago, uh, did I think that the advent of HIV was a likelihood, I would have given the same answer. But don't worry. You're quite safe here. The thing that's going to scare you or horrify you is a, is a reality-based thing. If you want to go and be entertained, surely you will be by the film. But also, if you want to go and have a, have a think about it, you, you can too, it'll stimulate that, you know?